Nestled between the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean, Mexico stands as a nation celebrated for its vibrant culture, rich history, and diverse population. Mexico's history is a mix of indigenous civilizations, Spanish conquest, and cultural influences from around the world. Its identity is steeped in a mix of Mesoamerican roots, European colonialism, subsequent waves of immigration, and a race of black people that the Mexico hoped to bury. The history of black people in Mexico is often overshadowed by the more prominent narratives of indigenous peoples and Spanish conquistadors. However, their presence predates even the Spanish arrival, with African slaves accompanying explorers and settlers to the New World. Over time, this Afro-Mexican community grew, forming a crucial part of Mexico's identity. Yet, as history unfolded, their contributions were often minimized and their voices silenced. This video will delve into the multifaceted experience of being black in Mexico, unveiling the layers of prejudice and discrimination that persist in Mexican society. Despite their rich cultural heritage and enduring contributions to Mexican music, cuisine, and traditions, black Mexicans have faced an uphill battle for recognition and acceptance. Also, as a way of supporting our efforts, hit the like button of the video, share, and subscribe to help the channel grow. Your support means a lot to us. To understand the experiences of black people who are often made invisible in Mexico, we must delve into the historical roots of their marginalization. The history of black people in Mexico is intertwined with the broader historical narratives of slavery, colonialism, and race relations. Let's take a journey back in time to explore how it all began. The presence of Africans in what is now Mexico predates the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors. African slaves were among the crew members accompanying Spanish explorer Hernán Cortés when he landed on the coast of Mexico in 1519. These early African arrivals played a significant role in the conquest and colonization of the region. During the early colonial period, the Spanish crown implemented a system known as the Encomienda, which granted Spanish settlers the right to extract labor and tribute from indigenous populations. This system was also applied to black Africans who were brought to Mexico as slaves. They were subjected to harsh labor conditions, often on sugar and silver plantations. In the 19th century nation building period throughout Latin America, the notion of a post-racial society that was mestizaje, mixed race, gained traction. Versions of mestizaje vary among countries. In Mexico, after the country gained independence in 1821, the caste system was officially dismantled and government envisioned the end of distinct racial identities codified in the caste system. Heavily influenced by the essay, The Cosmic Race, by writer and intellectual Jose Vasconcelos, the country's first education minister, the ideal emerged of a singular mestizaje Mexican national identity. Vasconcelos helped consolidate mestizaje as a mythical story of building the Mexican nation through racial mixing where whiteness is desired and privileged with the promise of an inclusive society. At least until recently, blackness was denied under mestizaje. Part of promoting mestizaje identity meant intellectual and artistic movements fostered a romanticized image of indigenous people and sought to absorb indigeneity into symbols of national pride, while enacting political, economic, and educational policy designed to assimilate indigenous people. Throughout the 20th century, the census of indigenous Mexicans was exclusively based on language. Mexico's constitution has only recognized indigenous populations and communities since 1992. The government included a question allowing indigenous people to self-identify on the 2000 census following indigenous advocacy. After achieving independence in 1821, Mexico faced significant political and economic challenges. The legacy of slavery and discrimination persisted, limiting opportunities for Afro-Mexicans. Land distribution and access to education were particularly unequal. Afro-Mexicans also faced political exclusion in the post-independence era. They were often underrepresented in political offices and decision-making processes. The political landscape remained dominated by those of Spanish and Creole descent, making it challenging for black communities to advocate for their rights and interests. Afro-Mexicans have had their very existence erased by mestizo ideology. To get back their voice, they would push the Mexican government to include a black ancestry question on the national census for the first time in two centuries in 2020. It found that about 2.5 million of Mexico's 127 million people identify as black.
But the dramatic findings of the academic studies showed that the issue in Mexico was bigger than just the marginalization of historic communities. It was a pigmentocracy, in the words of academic Edward Tells, in which skin color is the most important determinant of a person's economic and educational attainment. In 2017, Daniel Zizumbo Kalunga of Vanderbilt University, an expert in political psychology and behavior, published a study confirming darker skin is strongly associated with decreased wealth and less schooling, and race is the single most important determinant of a Mexican citizen's economic and educational attainment. According to the study, the Mexico data clearly showed people with white skin completing more years of schooling than those with browner skin, 10 years versus 6.5. That's a stunning 45% gap in educational achievement between the darkest and lightest skinned Mexicans. Darker skinned Mexicans surveyed had also completed fewer years of schooling than the survey's average nationwide finding of nine years. Wealth similarly correlates to skin color. The average Mexican household income in the LAYPOP study was about $193 a month. Citizens with lighter skin reported bringing in more than that, on average $220 a month. Darker skinned citizens, on the other hand, earn just $137, 41.5% less than their white compatriots. Overall, populations identified as having the lightest skin fall into the highest wealth brackets in Mexico, while those with the darkest skin are concentrated at the bottom. These dynamics, other studies have found, seem to persist across generations. Similar disparities emerged when we examined other measures of economic well-being such as material possessions like refrigerators and telephones and basic amenities. For example, only 2.5% of white Mexicans surveyed by Vanderbilt's pollsters don't have running water, while upwards of 11% of dark-skinned citizens said they lack this basic necessity. Likewise, just 7.5% of white Mexicans reported lacking an in-home bathroom versus 20% of dark-skinned Mexicans. The findings complicate the results of numerous prior studies showing that Mexicans do not perceive skin color as a meaningful source of prejudice in their lives. According to a 2010 national survey on discrimination, Mexicans believe that age, gender, and social class have a greater impact on their daily lives than race. This perception likely relates to the country's tradition of celebrating its raza mestiza, or multiracial heritage. Just last September, President Enrique Peña Nieto declared el mestizaje, racial mixing, as the future of humanity. The data paints a much less rosy picture. Race, it turns out, has a greater impact on a Mexican's human development and capital accumulation than any other demographic variable. The results show that Mexico's skin color gap is two times the achievement gap documented between northern and southern Mexicans, which is an inequality more often cited in Mexico. It is also five times greater than the urban-rural divide reported in the poll. The findings reveal that skin color has a significantly greater impact on wealth and education than does ethnicity, that is, indigenous versus white or mixed-race Mexican. The results add to a growing body of academic research highlighting a reality the government doesn't want to admit. Racism exists in Mexico. Racial and ethnic biases have so far been documented in Mexico's allocation of public resources, politics, and notably the labor market. A recent report from the National Institute of Statistics, for example, finds that white people comprise 27% of all white-collar workers and just 5% of the agricultural sector. Occasionally, some high-profile incident will bring Mexico's racism to light, exposing the true experiences of black people in Mexico. For example, there was outcry in 2013 when Aeromexico, Mexico's most important airline, issued a commercial casting call saying that Nadi Moreno, no dark-skinned people, need to audition. More often, though, racism is ignored or explained away. Many Mexicans, for example, argue that dark-skinned Mexicans tend to belong to ethnic, cultural, and linguistic minorities and live in historically disadvantaged areas like the rural south and the heavily indigenous high mountains. Since this is the case, they reason data that appears to show race-based inequality in Mexico is actually capturing class, ethnic, and regional inequalities. Although the premise of this argument holds true, the conclusion is incorrect. However, studies always accounted for gender, age, region of residence, and ethnic origin, and still skin color emerged as a powerful determinant of wealth and education levels. A second critique of racism in Mexico is that yes, it exists, but it is not as bad as in other places in the region like Brazil or the United States. However, 
Studies on the subject run contrary to that argument. Among nations surveyed in the Americas barometer, Mexico ranks fourth in terms of the negative impact of skin tone on an individual's wealth behind Bolivia, Uruguay, and Ecuador. On the relationship between race and lower levels of education, Mexico moves up one spot to trail only Ecuador and Trinidad and Tobago. Indeed, the sole place in the Americas where people of color seem to fare worse overall than in Mexico is Ecuador, where America's barometer data shows that having dark skin reduces educational achievement by one year more than it does in Mexico. This is in stark contrast to countries like Chile and Costa Rica, where race appears to have only a minor impact on wealth and education. The analysis unambiguously disproved the notion that Mexico is somehow so mixed race, so mestizo, as to be race blind. Quite to the contrary, racism is a severe social challenge that people in society and government would do well to take more seriously. Though Mexico continues to deny that it is a racist country that does not recognize its black population, the facts continue to prove otherwise. In the media and advertising, there are clear instances of white superiority and racism. The Spanish colonial legacy in Mexico has meant that lighter skin is associated with societal superiority and economic advantage. And what is the point of advertising if not to make people want to be something better than they are? Nowadays in Mexico, the citizen consumer is bombarded with advertising images that blatantly illustrate the overlap of racism and classism in the social hierarchy. From beer and car companies to department stores and supermarket chains, the whiteness of ads has become a sort of sinister elephant in the room, urging poor Mexicans to spend their way out of socioeconomic misery into an impossibly whiter future. As social anthropologist Juris Tipa notes in a 2020 peer-reviewed paper on colorism in Mexican advertising, the overwhelmingly dominant casting profile requested by firms for commercial advertisements is international Latino, which basically translates into someone with light skin, dark hair, and dark eyes, reinforcing the imagery of a Europeanized Latin Americanity at the expense of the average Mexican. Meanwhile, the Afro-Mexican population is effectively rendered invisible by the commercial advertising landscape, as Juris observes. In contributing to the perpetuation of a vicious cycle of colorist discrimination, advertising firms and their clients have helped maintain a colonial pigmentocracy in Mexico. Sometimes, the Mexican advertising industry gets publicly called out for its racist shenanigans, like in 2018 when an ad campaign for Indio Beer featured a bunch of fair-skinned Mexicans sporting t-shirts on which the phrase Pinche Indio, F Indian, a prevalent insult in Mexico, was partially crossed out and replaced with Orgullosamente Indio, or Proudly Indian. According to the minds behind the campaign, its objective was to raise awareness of discrimination in the country, something that is clearly best achieved by having white people appropriate indigenous identity. The problem doesn't stop at advertisements. In early 2022, several employees of an upscale Mexico City steakhouse came forward with a damning allegation. The restaurant had a policy of segregation in which the best tables were reserved for the customers with the lightest skin. The notion of whiter Mexicans getting preferential treatment was not surprising in a country where darker skinned people have long earned less money, received less schooling and been all but invisible in the media. Within days, activists mounted a boycott and the city launched an investigation into the restaurant, Sonora Grill Prime, which denied the accusations. Multiple public figures highlighted the scandal as evidence of pervasive bigotry. Racism is real, Mayor Claudia Scheinbaum told reporters, using a word long regarded as taboo. We have to accept that it exists and fight it. Most Afro-Mexicans still live in poverty, often in isolated rural communities with negligible sanitation, health or education services. The majority of Mexico's contemporary African descendant population lives in the Costa Chica region, which includes the Caribbean coastal regions of the southern states of Oaxaca and Guerrero. The lack of roads in Costa Chica continues to hinder much of the economic activity of the region. This lack of infrastructure paired with the declaration of the Pinotepa region as a national reserve with logging strictly prohibited has made it difficult for Afro-Mexicans to sustain themselves economically or even build their own shelter. Today, their primary sources of income are fishing, agriculture, mostly for their own consumption, and domestic work. Because the majority of Afro-Mexicans live in the poorest regions of Mexico, 
they lack adequate primary and secondary education and are largely absent from institutions of higher education. In July 2018, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women expressed concern at ongoing discrimination and stereotyping against groups including Afro-Mexican women, as well as at practices such as forced evictions affecting them. The findings slowly translated to activism. The cause got a big boost with the 2018 election of Lopez Obrador. At his inauguration, he received a traditional cleansing during an indigenous ceremony and vowed to lift up indigenous groups who live with oppression and racism, with poverty and marginalization. Two years later, a popular comedian was forced to apologize after he called the president's dark-skinned youngest son, Chocolate Flan. During an annual Independence Day celebration in which the president traditionally shouts, long live Mexico, before a screaming crowd, Lopez Obrador added a new phrase, death to racism. Another turning point came with the 2018 Oscar-winning film, Roma, which starred Yalitza Aparicio, a Oaxacan who became a lightning rod for discussions about race. She was subjected to ridicule by comedians and a top soap opera star who used a racial slur. But her acclaim, she was nominated for an Oscar for Best Actress and graced the covers of Vogue Mexico and Vanity Fair, also made her a role model for many. Today, activists continue to push for more diversity in the film and television industry and have launched campaigns to end profiling by police. Using Twitter and TikTok, they've called out companies and celebrities for discrimination and have popularized a new term white Mexican, a mix of the words white and Mexican, to refer to the nation's wealthy, light-skinned elite. The movement has President Andres Manuel López Obrador as its most powerful ally. Obrador, who is a tan-faced leftist, came from the poor state of Tabasco, where his family had been subjected to racial smears, and has highlighted the issue of racism like no other leader in Mexico's history. However, Racism continues to rear its ugly head and doesn't seem to be coming to a stop at any time soon. Not long ago, activists had watched a scandal unfold in Los Angeles that feels remarkably close to home, when three Latino members of the Los Angeles City Council were caught on tape deriding indigenous Mexicans as short, dark-skinned, and ugly. It didn't surprise me at all, said Jose Antonio Aguilar, the founder of the group Racismo MX. Of course, the racism we experience here is exported to immigrant communities in the United States, he said. The scandal reminded him of a secret recording that came to light in 2015, in which the head of Mexico's Electoral Institute was captured impersonating the leader of an indigenous group. The official kept his job, but in recent months, student activists resurfaced the recording to protest his appearance at a university event. The story was such a huge scandal that revealed how Latinos truly viewed Africans and black people. Behind closed doors, Los Angeles City Council President Nuri Martinez made openly racist remarks, derided some of her council colleagues, and spoke in unusually crass terms about how the city should be carved up politically. The conversation remained private for nearly a year, until a leaked recording reverberated explosively Sunday and turned the focus of a sprawling metropolis toward Los Angeles City Hall. Martinez and the other Latino leaders present during the taped conversation were seemingly unaware they were being recorded, as Martinez said a white council member handled his young black son as though he were an accessory, and described Councilman Mike Bonin's son as Paris Changuito, or like a monkey. The group was discussing a dispute between council members Curran Price and Marquise Harris Dawson, who were at odds last year over whose district would represent USC and Exposition Park once the new maps were finalized. The clip begins with Martinez recounting a conversation she allegedly had with businessman Danny Bakewell. During the conversation with council members Gil Cedillo and Kevin DeLeon and Los Angeles County Federation of Labor President Ron Herrera, Martinez described Bonin at one point as a little bitch, according to a recording of the meeting reviewed by the Times. Martinez also mocked Oaxacans and said, F that guy, he's with the blacks, while speaking about Los Angeles County Dist. Addy, George Gascon. De Leon appeared to compare Bonin's handling of his child to Martinez, holding a Louis Vuitton handbag. The conversation took place in October 2021 and focused heavily on council members' frustration with maps that had been proposed by the city's 21-member redistricting commission. Along with revealing cruel and racist comments, the leaked audio offered a rare window into the behind-the-scenes machinations of the redistricting process 
and the bare-knuckled fighting between various groups trying to secure political power. After the leak was published online, Martinez issued a statement apologizing for her comments, saying, In a moment of intense frustration and anger, I let the situation get the best of me and I hold myself accountable for these comments. For that, I am sorry. The context of this conversation was concern over the redistricting process and concern about the potential negative impact it might have on communities of color, she added. My work speaks for itself. I've worked hard to lead this city through its most difficult time. De Leon also called the comments wholly inappropriate and said he had fallen short of the expectations we set for our leaders. I regret appearing to condone and even contribute to certain insensitive comments made about a colleague and his family in private, he said in a statement. I've reached out to that colleague personally. Sedillo, contacted by the Times Saturday night, said, I don't have a recollection of this conversation. On Sunday night, Herrera apologized and asked for forgiveness, saying there is no justification and no excuse for the vile remarks made in that room. And I didn't step up to stop them, and I will have to bear the burden of that cross moving forward, he said. Regardless, the damage was already done. The persistent racism against Afro-Mexicans and the denial of its existence inflict deep and lasting harm on individuals and communities. Despite the resilience of activists and the undeniable evidence of racial discrimination, there remains a pervasive unwillingness in Mexican society to acknowledge and address this issue. Mexico's new racial reckoning has met resistance from parts of society, with some of the country's top media personalities accusing activists of importing radical ideologies from the United States and seeking to divide the nation along racial lines. They're just looking to tear us apart, a light-skinned anchor with the news channel ADN40 had once said at a roundtable in response to the activism about diversity in the media. Much of the work for activists has been focused on a basic first step, getting their compatriots to recognize that Mexico is a country with racial differences, even if it lacks the more rigid racial categories of a place like the United States. While being black in Mexico has historically meant navigating a landscape rife with prejudice and discrimination, the tireless efforts of activists provide a beacon of hope. They remind us that the struggle for equality is ongoing and that change is possible. These dedicated individuals and organizations are pushing for a more inclusive Mexico where Afro-Mexicans and all citizens have the opportunity to live their lives free from the burdens of racial bias and systemic inequality. As we reflect on the experiences, challenges, and triumphs of being black in Mexico, let us not forget the resilient spirit and unwavering determination of those working tirelessly to forge a better path forward. As these efforts continue, Mexico has the opportunity to move closer to a future where every citizen, regardless of their racial background, can enjoy equal opportunities, dignity, and a society that truly values and celebrates its rich diversity. This brings us to the end of this video. Tell us what you think in the comment section, as we are always interested in your thoughts. As always, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos to let more people know the truth about blacks and to hear their own part of the narratives. Thanks for watching.